Hi everyone and welcome to the second in our series of lectures that are focused specifically on prisons. In this lecture we're going to begin by continuing our look at life inside prison specifically with a focus on two innovative approaches one in Missouri and one in Arizona. And the reason why I've highlighted both of the Missouri and Arizona examples is to sort of show some sort of alternative approaches to how prisons are conceptualizing and sort of organizing the experience for inmates during their prison sentence. Um, and in both of these, you'll see that how the day-to-day -day operations of the prison, the day-to-day -day experience of the individuals serving sentences are not just there for punishment purposes, but also there to prepare those individuals for their eventual release back into society. We're then going to take a close look at five of the predominant prison gangs within the prison system. The readings that correspond to this lecture are a continuation of what we've seen throughout this, this series of lectures on prisons, which are chapters 10 and 11, as well as chapters 13 and 14 from your course textbook. The first innovative approach I would like us to take a look at took place in Missouri um, in the late 1990s into the early 2000s. And in the literature, it's often rever referred to as Missouri's parallel universe. So what was the impetus for designing this sort of innovative approach um, to prison? Well, one of the things that sort of led to it was the realization that less than 3% of people who are sentenced to prison are actually going to finish their life incarcerated. So whether it's people who are sentenced to a life term, whether it's people who are sentenced to the death penalty, or people who happen to, to die while serving their sentence in prison, that overall group of individuals is a very small percentage of the total prison population. And in fact, estimates show that 95 to 97 percent of people who are sentenced to prison are going to be released. They are going to return to our communities. And therefore, it's important for us to understand the need for rehabilitation, the need for preparation, and the need to plan for reintegration for most inmates. A second sort of impetus that led to the parallel universe was looking at explanations for criminal behavior, um, theories of crime, why do individuals end up engaging in criminal behavior in the first place? And what they found was that a lot of these explanations find that criminal thinking and behavior are largely egocentric. It is very much a self-centered focus from the point of view of the offender. Um, and offenders often focus on their own wants as opposed to others. Uh, they rationalize their bad behavior. They fail to realize the impact of their action on others, on their family members, on the larger community. And in efforts to engage in um, criminal behavior, they often ignore social norms and values. And as you can imagine, these things that are listed in this bullet point are not very conducive to a successful adjustment or successful surviving within a, a community that relies on people to work together, um, to not be overly egocentric. And the focus within Missouri, Missouri's parallel universe was how do we shift the focus for these in, individuals to stop always focusing on I and instead start focusing on the we and the part that you that any individual plays within a larger community. Another concept was recognition that classically prisons are designed to focus on control. And if you think about it, that makes sense. Prisons are there to house and incarcerate dangerous individuals or individuals who are being punished for having broken the law. And more often than not, these are laws that are rather severe laws that they have broken. And therefore, one of the key components that the prisons must, must do is focus on the fact of order within the prisons, making sure inmates follow rules, make sure that inmates are safe, but also that they are kept away from the rest of society in order to promote public safety. So the, the necessity of control is paramount within prisons. 
And within prisons, in a classic sense, prisoners lose their freedom of choice. They don't get to choose necessarily what they're going to have for their meals or when they're going to go to sleep, when they're going to get up, what they're going to do throughout their day. Their day. In, order to main, in order to maintain control, the wardens and correctional officers and staff need to have a very regimented schedule for these inmates. And what happens is, is prisoners, because they've lost their freedom of choice and their in environment is very overly controlled, their focus isn't on necessarily trying to seek out pleasure during their prison sentence, but rather their focus is on avoiding punishment. Um, and we've seen this, we've talked about how people sort of transition and cope within the prison setting by, you know, avoiding eye contact, avoiding unnecessary conversations, trying to stay to yourself, things that thing of that nature. And once again, when we contrast this with the larger community and, and existence within community life in general, as a happy, successful citizen, hopefully you're not walking through your daily life just trying to avoid getting in trouble from your boss or law enforcement or teachers or your parents. Hopefully you're seeking out joy. Um, and how do we sort of manage that contradiction when we look at life within prison where there is the necessity for control, but yet and individuals are taught to live a life of avoiding punishment. Is that gonna help them when they're gonna be released back into the community? Probably not. And so when we think about what's wrong with that approach, we have to understand that individuals need to know when to listen to their supervisors, when to listen to authority figures, and find a balance between sort of control versus seeking pleasure and joy in life. And when we think about this, one of the things that we have to do when looking at their preparation for, le for release is that individuals need to be learning new skills and need to learn how to internalize society's values in order to be successful. So whether that's being no longer being self-centered and egocentric or whether that's learning how to exist in a society that is not overly controlling and still be able to get through your day-to-day -day life, these are key components for a lot of inmates. So the Missouri's Parallel Universe is broken down into four major components. And on the slides to follow, we're going to go through each one of these components relatively briefly, but to kind of give you an idea of what the philosophy behind this approach um, includes. So let's take a quick look at what those four components are to begin with. So the first thing is, is the notion of productive activity that parallels the real world. So the inmates within Missouri's program, prisons that went through the Parallel Universe program, the idea wasn't just to quote unquote do time and stay out of the way and, you know, sit in your cell or go out in the yard and, and exercise a little bit and basically just make it through the day. Rather, what they wanted to do was make sure that the day-to-day -day life mimicked what it's like in the real world for a successful individual. Now that's whether that's a student who has to get up and go to school and study for classes, or an individual who has to get up and take care of their family members and, and take care of the household uh, throughout the day, or, or an individual who has a job and has to show up and be productive at their job. They wanted to sort of create something like that within the prison environment. A second component was the recognition and practicing the adoption of relapse prevention strategies. Now, relapse could be relapse into criminal behavior, or it could be relapse into um, substance abuse or addiction, or it could be relapse into certain sort of um, behavioral outcomes like you know anger-fueled rages and things of that nature. And one of the things that they wanted to introduce within the parallel universe was not only to get individuals to recognize triggers for potential relapse, but also figure out ways to prevent those relapse strategies so that they would have the tools to do that once they were returned back into society in general. And then a third component is the recognition of choice. 
and having inmates earn choice making opportunities. Once again, with a, a mind focusing on release back into society where for all of us walking the streets within our communities, every moment of every day we make choices. Um, and those choices determine how successful we are um, and what the next set step of opportunities and life events are going to be for us. Um, and this is one of those things, rather than having individuals who are told what to do all the time, learning how to make proper choices as they go through their day-to-day -day, um, activities. Finally, uh, is the recognition of good conduct and status improvement. So once again, with an aim towards looking at the free society was individuals in prison, if they're always thinking about avoiding punishment and if they're in an overly controlled environment, they're never trying to better themselves. They're never realizing that maybe if I am a good person, if I work hard at my job, if I get good grades in school, if I am a good father or husband or mother or daughter or whatever it may be, all those things in the real world can potentially improve my status in life. And they needed to introduce that to these inmates. So let's take a look at each one of these four components in a little more detail. The first step in the parallel universe is productive activity. And productive activity, you can think about sort of your day-to-day -day life living in your local community. You can kind of divide your day into sort of your work hours and your non-work hours. So most of us, in order to be productive and feel productive on any given day, we're going to get up, get dressed, have something to eat, and prepare for our day. Now, during work hours, maybe we have a job that we need to go to. Maybe we have school and we have classes we need to attend or study for. Um, maybe we have household duties that we need to take care of around our house or our apartment or our dwelling where we live. And those keep us busy throughout the day and also give us a sense of accomplishment throughout the day that we have done something to better our life and better our living situation. And then we'll also notice that even during our off hours, the most productive individuals don't just come home and sit and watch TV or start playing video games or just veg out on the couch. Most people, if you think about the most productive people you know in your life, they find a way to fill their hours of their day, even their non-work hours. And that's what they wanted to bring into the prisons in Missouri in order to prepare these inmates for, you know, what it takes to actually successfully and productively fill all the hours and minutes of every day once they're back on the outside. So during work hours, the concept in Missouri was buns out of bed. You're getting up. You're not sleeping in. You're not being lazy. If you have school to attend, you should go to your classes, know when your classes are, know what subjects you should prepare for and be ready for it. If you have work, once again, oftentimes you may have a job or responsibility on the prison grounds that can mimic and be similar to going to a job once you're back in the community, whether it's, you know, whether it's in laundry, whether it is in, in cooking in the kitchen, whether it's in maintenance and cleaning, maybe it's um, something doing something with landscaping around the, the prison facility, whatever it may be, you want to mimic that get up, get prepared, go to work. And for them, it wasn't just occasional work assignments. The spirit was, whether it was school, work, or some combination, that you spend a full day, eight to five, nine to five, once again, mimicking that real life scenario, and five days a week. Um, when it came to work, you did, weren't just granted jobs simply because you were a warm body. No, rather you had to interview for jobs. And you can imagine, once again, that's going to make certain types of positions at the prison more desirable. Um, and therefore, it, it introduces just the right amount of competition within inmates to try to be better, to get a better work assignment, and therefore have to be able to convince individuals that they are, have the skills and talents and are ready for that type of job. Another thing that may be part of the work hours is treatment. So just as if somebody may go to a doctor's appointment or go meet with a therapist during the days, same idea. If an individual needed to meet with a counselor or a substance abuse treatment program or something along those lines, they could fill their days with that. And then once again, during non-work hours, they, the idea of productivity was not forgotten. 
Um, and during non-work hours, individuals may sign up to be engaged in community service programs um, or other reparation type programs, as you can see. So may, that may include participation in victim offender mediation, uh, taking impact classes or reparative projects. And the spirit here with both the work hours and non-work hours kind of goes back to that concept of if you think about when do most people engage in criminal behavior, whether they're juveniles or whether they're adults. It most criminal behavior takes place during sort of those idle down times for an individual. So if we look at, you know, how for juveniles, there is a major spike in criminal behavior amongst juveniles in the after school hours. So from about on weekdays, from about 3 to 7 p.m., we see major spikes. Why? Because the kids are no longer in a productive environment like school and unless they have a job or sports or some other activity to engage in they have free time and unfortunately for some individuals having too much free time means idle time to get involved with things that may lead you down the wrong path and the same thing is true for adults um, there's a certain sense of responsibility and sort of connection that comes with knowing that you have to go to work or knowing that you have to go to school and even during those non-work hours, whether it's community service, reparation, exercise, things of that nature, all those things can help fill the hours of the day and give you a sense of self-worth and accomplishment. The second component within Missouri's Parallel Universe are relapse prevention strategies. So within these, and think about what we talked about at the, begin, the beginning part as far as what the, the sort of motivations for the parallel universe were in the first place. One of them was trying to get individuals to break away from sort of that self-centered, egocentric mentality. Um, and then a second, obviously, for many inmates is going to be making sure that have any sort of addictions or disorders that they're facing are able to be handled and addressed. So under this relapse prevention strategies, we're covering carrying or covering quite a few of those things. So one is good citizenship training. And I ask here, well, why is that important? Well, think back to that egocentric nature, right? How do I engage with other individuals knowing that maybe we have different viewpoints? We have different viewpoints about politics or religion or, you know, healthy lifestyle choices, whatever it may be. But just because I disagree with somebody doesn't mean that I have to be antagonistic towards them or angry towards them. And I should be able to coexist in a, in a community setting. Um, and part of this isn't just a matter of telling somebody to stop being egocentric, stop using drugs, stop doing whatever. Oftentimes it's much more involved with than that, right? There's a certain amount of, of mental cognitive restructuring that needs to take place and almost reshaping how somebody sees the world, how they see appropriate behavior, how they um, sort of determine what is appropriate lifestyle choices. And within that, we see a focus of focusing less on the I, more on the we. Um, staying sober. Obviously, we've talked, we've spoken before about the high percentage of inmates who have some sort of alcohol or substance abuse um, background. Therefore, the ability to stay sober, especially when you have a lot of free choices and opportunities out in the larger community, that can be one of the hardest and most difficult things for many people. And so one of the things within Missouri is they focus on the concept of being proactive. So proactive may be living your life and sort of restructuring your day-to-day -day life in order to avoid triggers um, to your addictions and, and disorders that you faced in the past. Um, avoid certain settings and places and maybe even avoid certain individuals um, and be proactive. If you start to notice um, tendencies or desires, that may be the time to seek help from somebody. Um, or to change your day-to-day -day life in order to re, you know, reapproach your day-to-day -day activities. And then family involvement. And family involvement is one of the things that I have spoken about before, and I'll talk more about it in one of our future um, lectures about prisons. But one, more and more research is coming out that the role that families can play in helping individuals who are serving a prison sentence get through that time and then also successfully readjust once they re-enter the community. Um, so, and oftentimes the sad reality is an individual goes off to prison, there may be um, ties with their family may be completely severed. Um, the family may ignore them depending upon where they are located 
interacting and communicating with the family may be difficult due to um, distance and geography or due to different limitations as far as mail or other forms of communication between the family and the inmate who is serving time. So within Missouri's parallel universe, this, this recognition of the necessity of family involvement as being a key component for preparing individuals for their eventual release was, was paramount. Um, and we see, you can think about it, um, family involvement teaches you how to focus less on I. Um, your family can be active individuals in helping you to stay sober and provide feedback to you whenever you might need that help. And this notion really comes into the idea of getting everyone on board. Um, it's not uncommon and perhaps not surprising that family members are often going to feel let down by an individual who has been convicted of a felony and is serving time in prison. Uh, they may feel embarrassed by that individual. They may feel disappointed. They may feel as if they want to shut that person out of their life. But one of the things here is family is one of the strongest things that many people have that can keep them feeling like a normal person, feel like a valuable person. And within Missouri, there was this focus on trying to get everyone on board, not just the inmates, but their extended family members out in the community and have communications with them and try to sort of repair broken bridges. The third component of Missouri's parallel universe is revolves around choice decision making and the outcomes that occur for all of us when we make choices every day and i mentioned this earlier and i'll say it again every day we make thousands or maybe not thousands but at least hundreds of choices throughout the day um, what to eat what time to leave for an appointment, what to wear, um, when we interact with somebody at a, at a store or while driving down the road or while riding on the bus, choosing what to say, what not to say in response to any sort of interaction, right? All these little things, these choices add up and they, they dictate sort of the, the path that our life is going to take. So the focus within the parallel universe is on one, making those little decisions, um, knowing when to speak out and, and speak your mind versus knowing when to sort of try to find a middle ground when you're working with somebody, um, making those decisions about, you know, do I leave five minutes later or do I try to leave a few minutes early for an appointment, uh, making decisions about the appropriate type of, of diet and food and exercise we engage in, who we hang out with, where we go on our off days. All these things are sort of built into this parallel universe. Um, and along with that is the recognition that with every choice, there are consequences. And just because things don't turn out the way you want, you made the choice, you need to recognize those consequences. Um, and I see one of the things that we often talk about is if you wake up in the morning and you know you're supposed to be at work or you know work by 9 a.m. and you notice it's raining outside when you wake up. Well, do you choose to go about your normal schedule and leave the normal time that gets you there right at 8.59, right before the nine o'clock hour? Or because you notice that it's raining outside, should you choose to leave 5, 10, 15 minutes earlier, knowing that the road conditions might, might not be great and that will assist you with getting there on time? And if you think about it, if you show up late for work, you, people will come up with all sorts of excuses. But if you go back to it, the reason more often than not that an individual showed up late for work was because of the little choices they made prior to departing that morning for their job. And if they had made slightly different choices, things would have turned out differently. So if you're late for work, accept the consequences. Maybe it's a dock and pay. Maybe you're reprimanded, but that's okay. They will you'll use it as a learning tool to move forward. And this is one of the, the key things within um, the parallel universe, because for a lot of um, inmates in prison, one of the things that they've struggled with that led to their current condition in life was choice and the choices that they made, but also their either ability or inability to accept the consequences that they made. So as opposed to blaming other individuals or rationalizing poor decision making, 
this focus, this component says, no, you need to recognize if you made a mistake, own it. And that's okay because it'll help you as you move forward in life. Problem solving was another um, major component of this uh, decision-making thing. And one of the ways that this was sort of introduced within the parallel universe was if an inmate has an issue, they have an issue with the cell that they're in. They have an issue with um, their cellmate. They have an issue with how they're being treated by the correctional officers. They have an issue with the, the quality of reading material available to them in the library, whatever it may be. For inmates who feel like they have a grievance or want to raise something to the staff within the prison, oftentimes there's a lengthy grievance process, which can overwhelm all of us, right? Um, and anytime something drags on, it makes the problem solving, you just want things to go away. You almost aren't even, you've lost focus on what the problem was and how you would have liked it to be solved in the first place. So within the parallel universe, what they try to do was limit the length of these processes and instead bring in more informal two-sided approach. So have the inmate speak with another inmate or have the inmate speak with a staff member as an approach to sort of mediate and sort of find a middle ground in order to address a problem, figure out the appropriate response to it that will satisfy all parties and move forward. Similar, once again, to what you hope you can do in the real world. Um, inmates were also given the opportunity to be, participate in the governance of the institution. Um, so one of the things I think that for many of us who are citizens living in our communities, we often talk about something as simple as the right to vote, right? To feel like your voice is heard and you've had an opportunity to say something. That does mean something for, for should mean something for all of us. Um, but also sometimes to be able to, the opportunity to run for a, a position, volunteer for something, run for city council, be on the board of, you know, an agency that is making decisions within, you know, your local society. That was the idea here and, and giving inmates an opportunity to participate in the governance of the institution. Now, this may be simply having a voice in determining what the meals are going to be that are going to serve, right? If you feel like you have a little bit of a voice, you feel like you're involved, you feel like you have power, that brings power pride that brings self-worth all these things which are positive outcomes um, another layer to this was the notion of allowing inmates to have personal management of their affairs so oftentimes inmates may have um, sort of a, a bank account or savings that they've accumulated in prison, right? Perhaps they've had money sent to them from family members. Perhaps they've earned money for their job or their duties that they're um, doing while serving their time in prison. In most prison settings, that money is tightly controlled by the staff, by the administration. Well, in the parallel universe, the idea was we need to give inmates a little bit more control of their own affairs. Um, this may be about their, their money and giving inmates more control as far as how they spend money, what they spend it on, um, and how it goes. Because when you're out in the, the real world and you have a bank account, you need to balance your you know, bank account, right? You need to be able to know how much money you allocate to pay rent, how much for food, and then how much you have for miscellaneous, the fun stuff at the end, right, as, as idea. But also personal management isn't always simply about money. Um, sometimes it's about your health. Um, if you have medication you're supposed to be taking, uh, making sure that you will remember to take the medication, go to your doctor for your checkups, as opposed to being told, right? These, you're an adult. You shouldn't have to rely on some the government or a family member to manage your affairs if you want to be a successful citizen. So within this idea, we start to see this, this notion, this point three, decision-making and earning a choice, really focuses on sort of taking accountability for your own actions and also starting to learn, oftentimes things that these individuals may have never learned, um, how to navigate day-to-day -day life, make yourself a meal, um, pay the rent on time, get to, to work on time, etc. And the final component of the parallel universe is good conduct and status improvement. So once again, trying to instill proper tools and skills 
it, within these inmates in order for them to be able to understand how to engage in proper behavior once they're released from prison and also to start to recognize sort of the benefits and the rewards that can come with being a good citizen that can lead to status improvement in your everyday life. Now, we would argue that status counts in both prison and the real world, but there's differences in how you obtain status historically in prison versus the real world. Now, yes, there may be certain parallels and overlaps depending upon the community, the time period, the setting, etc. But when we think about it, one big divide between how you sort of um, accumulate status in prison versus the real world is it's sort of how you sort of carry yourself um, around other individuals, right? In prison, being the tougher individual, being the more stoic individual, being the tight-lipped individual who is not going to engage in friendships and is, and is not going to necessarily say more than they need to is kind of what brings status in prison, right? And unfortunately, sometimes that status may require things like being violent um, or engaging in other illegal behavior. Those don't bode well for the real world, right? The real world status is going to come more from being able to work effectively with other individuals, um, building your education so that you can therefore, you know, move up in the workforce, um, start to accumulate more money, right? But hopefully accumulating money in a legitimate manner. So one of the things in the parallel universe was trying to think about, okay, how do we make sure and recognize the importance of status, but also teach inmates sort of the, the differences between status in the prison setting versus status in this real world setting. And a second component was the recognition of good behavior um, and saying that good behavior should not be seen as a weakness or a negative thing, getting along with other individuals, following rules, um, sort of deferring to another individual at times and putting your own self-interest aside. Those types of good behavior can sometimes be seen more as weaknesses in the prison setting. And yet those are the, exactly the things we would like to have somebody show in the real world world to successfully um, sort of integrate and survive within the real world. So within the parallel universe, they tried to promote good behavior by having positive rewards and outcomes associated with it. So this may lead to good behavior may lead to better work assignments, um, opportunities for additional family visits, um, and also as well as the acquisition of more goods and property, say from the you know the, the store um, within the the prison. That all these things that sort of bring both you know extrinsic and intrinsic rewards to the individuals. So. We've seen what the parallel universe, you know, sort of what it led to it, the, the motivations for it. Um, we also saw sort of the four components that were introduced um, within the parallel universe. Now let's see what the, the research outcomes were. Um, if we think that the parallel universe, the focus was on trying to get individuals to be prepared for life in the real world. And not just be prepared, but be prepared to succeed. And therefore, as the name implies, they wanted to parallel parallel what they were going to be facing once they were released from prison. Now, as you can imagine, if you're trying to critique what we've seen so far, incorporating all these components, you know, productive activities throughout the day, um, relapse prevention strategies, introducing choice making opportunities, etc. within the prison setting, prison setting itself, those components can be very expensive. Right? It's a lot easier just to keep all inmates on a very regimented schedule where everyone has a fixed schedule, they cannot deviate from it, and we basically just make it through each day successfully in prison. Right? That's the more affordable approach in prison. So when you start to introduce more productive activity opportunities or more counseling or therapy or more family visits within the, the prisons, you can imagine that gets really expensive. So a program like this is going to immediately get some pushback unless the outcomes are overwhelmingly positive. So let's take a look at what some of those outcomes were. Between 1994 and 2001, 
the number of inmates returned to prison in Missouri on new felony charges dropped from 33% to 19%. So we see about a 14% decrease in recidivism. And that's recidivism re measured as return to prison for new felony charges. Um, so that right there is a positive outcome for the parallel universe. It's not just a one or two point drop. It's a pretty significant drop um, in individuals being you know, avoiding recidivism for significant new charges. Um, however, despite the positive outcomes shown by Missouri's Parallel Universe, the program was discontinued in 2004. And that's sort of where our story ends. But before I, I end the story on Missouri and move over to Arizona, let's talk about why it was discontinued in 2004. And a search of the, the government websites um, in Missouri, the most that I could find at least, was a statement that the Parallel Universe had been discontinued because the department was going in a different direction. Now, I don't want to jump to conclusions, but one of the things I will say, and I think it's important for us to recognize, when we first started talking about the prison system, one of the things that I mentioned was that it is pretty much controlled by the executive branch of the state government, right? So it goes right up to the, the head honcho is going to be the governor. And therefore, there is a, a a uh, vital political connection between prison programs and politics. And perhaps not surprisingly, 2004 was a political year, an election year. And these are the types of things we often see. There may be a change in leadership, um, political leadership in the state. And therefore, they may look at programs like this, like Parallel Universe, and come to the conclusion that this is, you know, cost prohibitive, that it is, quote unquote, coddling inmates, that it is not tough on crime, etc. And therefore, it may be chosen to be cut as a return to, you know, the normal, more tough on crime approaches, which is unfortunate. And I'm not going to say that that was the sole reason for a program like this meeting its demise, but it's not uncommon for programs or innovative programs like the Parallel Universe to be shut down because they're seeing that the cost of running the program does not, um, does not bring enough benefit um, for the state in and of itself. And so that's where we end our story with Missouri. So let's take a look at Arizona's getting ready real quick. So Arizona adopted in 2004. So right as the Parallel Universe was coming to an end in Missouri, Arizona picks up um, similar ideas and adopts the, their quote unquote getting ready program. And their getting ready program has similar components to Missouri's parallel universe. You can read more about these in the document, the short reading article that I posted on Beachboard for you. Um, so what are some of the components that are sort of, you know, we can contrast and compare with Missouri? Well, one of the things they did in Arizona was having job salaries reflective of the real world rather than prison necessity. And what do I mean by that? Well, when we look at how inmates are paid for certain types of jobs within the prisons, oftentimes, historically, we have to think about, well, what is the most necessary things for a prison to effectively run. Well, that could be things like we need food, right? So maybe being skilled or working in the kitchen may be a high paying job. Um, we also need sa a sanitary environment. So therefore things like the showers and the bathrooms, um, janitorial skills, need to be done and so maybe those are higher paying jobs um, and things of that nature you know laundry um, we got to make sure that there's you know clean laundry and that uh, uniforms are being washed on a regular basis and yet so we see that jobs like working in the kitchen uh, janitorial work laundry work historically are some of the higher paying jobs within prisons however when you look at the real world does necessarily being a line cook or do, being a janitor or you know working in a laundry does that necessarily me, result in the highest paying jobs not really and one of the things they wanted to see in Arizona was start to have the sort of the positions and the jobs be more reflective of the real world and so they wanted to sort of value and and you know insert or introduce rewards for the jobs that required higher levels of education, higher levels of intelligence, uh, creative thinking, 
um, for individuals who had sort of mastered different sort of skill sets and had the, the, the training and the experience to do certain jobs. And therefore, by having individuals, inmates sort of value the opportunity to obtain jobs that actually use their mind, use their education, use their skill sets, and encourages them to continue to improve upon those areas, those would bode well for once they were released back into society. Um, and then also we can see sort of dovetailing with that is that job appointments were going to be reflective of educational level. And if you wanted a better job, you needed to improve your educational, your education. So maybe that meant going and finishing your GED if you had never finished high school or things of that nature. Um, we're also, they incorporated the sort of benefits that were focused on healthy living. So individuals who chose to eat a healthier diet or, you know, interspersed regular exercise or quote unquote healthy activities in their day to day were also given benefits and privileges and had opportunities for advancement while they were in prison. What were some of the outcomes of the Getting Ready program? Well, between 2003 and 2007, inmate assaults were down. Uh, sexual assaults were reduced over 50%. Inmate on inmate assaults were down 37.5%. Inmate on staff assaults were you know, reduced in, by over half. Um, and major rule violations were down 12.5%. And then on the outcome, one of the other things we saw, and I find this um, a rather promising thing for the Getting Ready program, was that GED graduates within the prison system grew from 791 to over three thousand inmates. So a major focus on education really started to come to fruition and, and inmates were taking advantage of this opportunity to improve their educational levels so that they could then show that and use those as stepping stones once they're released back into um, their local communities. So with both of these, Getting Ready and Parallel Universe. Now these are programs that the number one thing is they are going to be expensive. And also to do them properly, they need to be well organized and they need to be monitored. You need to have the right properly trained individuals running therapy, um, designing the programs and making sure that everything runs smoothly. So they're not necessarily going to be something that is going to pop up in every prison system around the country or around the world. But I do think they're worth noting and worth being, you know, keeping our eyes open for. And I think it really does come down to that first slide we saw that talked about sort of the impetus for the uh, parallel universe approach in Missouri the vast majority of people are going to get out of prison. They are going to return to our communities, period. Two, more and more research and theory behind criminal behavior shows that individuals tend to have an egocentric point of view. Um, and then when combined with other sort of so sociological pressures and inequities faced by these individuals, that does not bode well for them. And teaching them to how to navigate a society with less of an I focus and more of a we focus is beneficial. And then also finally that idea that the historical um, focus in prisons is a control environment, whereas the real world is much more of a free environment. And in order to exist within a free environment, you need to learn how to make proper choices and accept consequences. Let's shift our focus now to examining some prison gangs within the prison system. We're going to focus on five major prison gangs. And in a perfect world, we could probably have an entire semester focus just on the growth and emergence of prison gangs um, within the state prison systems and the federal prison systems. Um, but for the sake of this course, we're going to keep it somewhat short and we're going to focus on these five. Um, and roughly, we're going to go through them sort of in order of their emergence, mainly in California state prisons as well as the federal prison system. So we'll start with the Mexican uh, Mafia, La M.A. Um, followed by La Nuestra Familia, uh, the Black Gorilla Family, the Aryan Brotherhood, and then we'll wrap up with the Texas Syndicate. So the takeaways that I want you to sort of make sure you understand and absorb as we go through the next few slides are the following. Number one, think about sort of when and where on a timeline each one of these prison gangs emerged. 
Number two, think about sort of the, the motivation or the impetus for why these prison gangs emerge. And I think that tells an interesting historical story. Um, so you're thinking, are these more proactive sort of emerge? Like, was there a reason for them wanting to come together to accomplish some goal? Or was it more of a reactive, um, sort of like a quick reaction to other outside events that led to the emergence of this gang as a necessity? And then number three, think about what are some of the sort of the defining characteristics that make each one of these prison gangs unique? So sort of to quick recap, sort of when and where did they emerge? Sort of why did they emerge? And then what are some of sort of their major characteristics or identifiers for each one? So let's go ahead and dive into each one of these gangs. We'll start with the Mexican Mafia, La M A named after the letter M in the alphabet, um, emerged roughly the mid to late 50s at the Dual Vocational Institute in California. Um, originally, they came together as sort of protection uh, for Mexican-American and Mexican immigrant inmates to be protected from other races and other emerging gangs or small you know, groups or small gangs within the prison system. There was also sort of a focus on sort of just instilling violence in order to sort of wreak havoc and create chaos within the prison systems. Um, that was another sort of initial sort of focus for them, sort of this protection and violence. But as you'll see, that quickly changed within the first five to six years of their emergence. So I wouldn't even call the protection and violence sort of their major sort of um, what they've left behind as their mark on the prison gangs. But it sort of tells you about why they started. Um, one of their uh, major sort of um, originators of the Mexican Mafia uh, was Luis Huero Buff Flores. As you can see, there, there he's pictured there in that photo, um, circled over there in the upper left-hand corner. Um, he was an individual who had served time and was actually from Hawaiian Gardens here in Southern California and had a lengthy history of engaging in criminal behavior on the streets in, in Hawaiian Gardens with, with various uh, street gangs, found himself incarcerated and became one of the origina original members of the Mexican Mafia. Um, you can do some more research on him. Sadly, despite his efforts to sort of clean up his life once he got out of prison and even tried to raise a son and have his son avoid drugs and gangs, um, his downward spiral into the 70s and 1980s was rather disappointing to say the least, but I'll allow you to take a look at him um, whenever you have any time. So let's go a little bit deeper into the Mexican Mafia. So once they sort of became established, one of the things that really sets the Mexican Mafia apart from other gangs was being patterned after the Italian Mafia. Um, and so within the, the Mexican Mafia, we see that individuals, a very structured sort of ranking system where individuals within the Mexican Mafia were given titles um, similar to the Italian Mafia that sort of identify their level within the gang structure. Um, individuals who were sworn into the Mexican Mafia also are sworn to abide by a lengthy list of sort of values and commandments that they must follow. Um, all of this was sort of with the background of ethnic solidarity. And in fact, there are multiple stories of how for the Mexican Mafia that even though individuals may have been affiliated with competing or, or rival street gangs when they were out in the community, often rival street gangs that their only core uh, similarity was they were predominantly of Hispanic descent or Mexican American descent. But while on the streets, they were rival street gangs. But once they found their way into prison and were under the umbrella of the Mexican mafia, there was this, this sort of belief that individuals were encouraged to follow, which is we put aside those street level differences while we're in here, while we're in here, we are, we are all, you know, have this solidarity based upon our ethnic background. Um, they were also, after sort of settling in and sort of having this very business-like structure pattern after the Italian Mafia, the Mexican Mafia was proactive in realizing one of their key values, not just within the prison system, but also in the communities. They had a unique access in the drug trafficking trade, and they took advantage of this. 
And what do I mean by they had a unique traffic? Well, if you think about it, from the 1960s through, say, even the 1990s, just looking at that window of time, we think about some of the major drugs that were hitting the streets um, in California and in America. And we see things like marijuana, cocaine, heroin. If we trace back some of the where those drugs and where their you know actual products were coming from, they are coming from places like Mexico, Central America, Latin America, and then they're making their way up into the United States. And the Mexican mafia, because of their ethnic connections to Mexico, to um, Latin America, Central America, and South America, um, their comfort with the language, um, speaking Spanish, their family connections in those countries provided them a ideal situation to take control of drug trafficking. Um, but it also required them to be very businesslike in how they went about um, conducting their activities. And it led to sort of the power that we've seen with the Mexican mafia. Um, and it's been argued that the Mexican mafia is the deadliest and most powerful gang in the California prison system. As the Mexican Mafia's power grew, and it grew rather rapidly, even in the first 10, 15 years of existence, um, so as their power grew, whether it was through drug trafficking, so for sort of financial power, or in pure numbers of members, or geographical range and power that came along with that, with that power, eventually we started to see factions or divides, disagreements within the mafia itself. So similar to what we might see in the Italian mafia, where a member of one family feels like that as if they're being overshadowed or that they're not able to make a name for themselves and therefore chooses to break away from the family in order to establish their own name, grow their own power, thus leading to infighting and divides within the family or in the family we saw a similar thing within the Mexican Mafia. And the first major division is often referred to as the North-South Division. I also like to think of it as sort of the urban versus rural division, and I'll explain that here. And this division began in the 1960s. On one end, we saw sort of the South, and these are the individuals who sort of stuck with La M.A., the Mexican Mafia. And these were individuals who were had grown up um, in California within more urban environments, more uh, metropolitan environments, environments that had assimilated into American culture a little more and it had this, this blend of Mexican American culture. Um, and so a lot of these areas were areas like Los Angeles County, coastal counties, San Diego County, Riverside County, etc. And those individuals started to clash with what we call the North faction. And the North faction were individuals from say the Central Valley of California or Northern California and areas that were much more rural. Um, and these were individuals whose cultures and the communities that they came from hadn't quite assimilated into this American culture, but rather still had a much tighter strong to their, um, their Mexican roots. And so within this divide, we started to see a break. The South was La M.A., the Mexican Mafia, and the North became La Nuestra Familia. And um, we'll talk more about Nuestra Familia in, in a second. Um, but this became a, a, a brutal divide between these two groups. Um, but before we wrap up the Mexican Mafia, let's just mention a couple of things. To sort of illustrate the power that they have, if we look at street gangs across California and across America, the number of gangs who claim allegiance or ties to the Mexican Mafia continues to grow. Um, and you can see it with a lot of, you know, whether it's their artwork, whether it's tattoos, um, incorporating, whether it, incorporating the M or incorporating the number 13. And if you're unfamiliar, 13 as it is M is the 13th letter of the alphabet. We often see these closely tied as sort of a, a sign of allegiance to the Mexican Mafia. So La Nuestra Familia, um, as I mentioned before, a, a, a gang that sort of broke, splintered away from the Mexican Mafia with that sort of north-south divide. Um, that took place in the 1960s. So La Nuestra Familia sort of um, is claimed the origin goes back to 1965 at Soledad Prison. 
and these were for individuals who are, came from much more rural environments and tended to be more younger rural Mexican Americans and they who were, felt like they were being um, abused or felt like they were being mistreated within La M.A. And this group broke apart to sort of protect those individuals and sort of create a name for themselves. And you'll see, even with some of these pictures that we've got, uh, Nuestra Familia has much more of a tie to sort of the, you know, the culture of Mexico with the sombrero and the machete and things of that nature and a lot of their markings. Whereas when we look back to La M.A., we saw the, you know, the focus on sort of the Mexican pride with the, um, with the serpent and the eagle on the cactus, you know, dating back to Aztec lore and things of that nature. So we can even see divisions in some of their sort of like artistic representations of the groups. Um, as La Nuestra Familia grew and became more powerful, they became pro arguably one of the strongest and biggest enemies of La M.A. So even though they were sort of spawned from La M.A., they turned against them and both groups uh, now look at each other almost as a kill on sight order, um, as being, you know, um, rivals and, and bitter enemies. Just as La M.A. had sort of adopted the M, um, within the alphabet and the, the letter 13, La Nuestra Familia takes on the N and the number 14 for N being the 14th letter of the alphabet. So we often see that tied in um, when we speak of La Nuestra Familia. The next game we're gonna talk about is the Black Gorilla Family, um, sometimes referred to as BGF. The Black Gorilla Family, 1966 San Quentin. So once again, remember that I had mentioned that you think about sort of the time period of historical growth of these various prisons were or these various gangs so we had the mexican mafia in the 1950s and then we, as they grew in power we saw a factioning with la nuestra familia coming out in the mid early to mid 1960s and in both cases there was sort of a, a certain nature of proactive and reactive forces that led to their creation then we see our next prison gang, which is the Black Gorilla family in 1966 at San Quentin. And the individual um, most commonly tied with the origins of the Black Gorilla family was George Jackson. Now, George Jackson was an activist, um, a writer, um, an individual who had a, a engaged in criminal behaviors throughout his life. 1961, he was convicted of armed robbery, $70 at gunpoint. I believe it was at a gas station. And he was sentenced to one year to life. Um, so I think this is, before I go ahead talking much more about him for a second, let's tie some of the other things we've talked about in this class together. So one year to life for $70 taken in armed robbery. That's a pretty broad sentence, right? And this kind of goes back to, remember we talked about the differences between indeterminate sentences versus sort of mandatory and determinate sentences? This was during a time period of indeterminate sentences where individuals were handed a very open-ended sentence length, right? One year to life is huge. And so therefore you got to think about like, you know, what is his situation going to be like, like in prison? Is he going to be able to convince a parole board that he is reformed, that he is ready for release? Um, and we think about a lot of the discrimination and other things going on in the prisons. You can see that this is a, a tough sort of sentence for this individual to handle. But also think about the time period in which he, he founded the Black Gorilla family, 1966. This starts to correspond with sort of that, those easing of restriction, restrictions on inmates, right? We saw the prisoner's rights movement starting to come about. We saw the end of sort of the civil death, the hands-off policy. We saw that going away. So he was at the forefront of a time period where inmates started to get access to different sort of reading materials, um, were able to share their voice and become, you know, activists, even while they were behind prison walls. So a lot of things converged that led to sort of the growth of the Black Gorilla family. And one of the quotes that I think is sort of telling from George Jackson is this one right here, where it says, I met Marx, Lenin, Trotsky, Engels, and Mao when I entered prison and they redeemed me, right? He had access to a lot of this material that was being shared, especially amongst African-American inmates at that time and African-Americans in America in general, 
that were looking at different sort of political philosophies and sociological philosophies that sort of contrasted with sort of the, the capitalist nature of America. And we see a lot of this in, in sort of imbued into the black gorilla family. So the Black Gorilla family has been, you know, associated with, quote unquote, the Black Mafia, another group. Um, and as far as what sets them apart amongst these other gangs is that they are arguably the most politically oriented. Um, when George Jackson and other, um, you know, of the initial individuals came together to form the Black Gorilla family, it wasn't necessarily react a reactive thing. It was more of a proactive thing to bring together individuals to educate African, African American inmates about the, the nature of American society and the inequities and the racism that occurred and to come together in an, in an attempt to sort of raise the issues that they felt spoke to them um, and, inc and improve the conditions for not just them but their families and their friends out in the community. So the Black Gorilla family always had a very strong political sort of core about them that sort of drove them. Um, we see a lot of sort of Marxist, Maoist sort of, of philosophies within their ideas. Um, racism was one of their major pet peeves that they were looking to eradicate. And although they were historically small, especially compared to groups like the Mexican Mafia and the Aryan Brotherhood um, or other white, white uh, gangs or prison gangs, their numbers have been growing, unfortunately, especially as we saw the increase in African Americans being incarcerated in our state prisons, their numbers started to grow. Um, another interesting thing that we saw with the, uh, with the Black Gorilla family was similar to what I had mentioned before about the Mexican Mafia, whereas the Mexican Mafia, although that they are much more, you know, drug trafficking and business oriented, and the Black Gorilla family was much more politically oriented, both gangs had sort of a respect and a code where although individuals may come from different street gangs that were rival street gangs out in the community, once they were behind prison walls, there was a sense of solidarity and coming together um, within this larger group and putting aside outside differences. So we still see alignment with the Crips, Bloods, and other African-American oriented gangs and the Black Gorilla family. The next group we're going to talk about is the Aryan Brotherhood. Now, the Aryan Brotherhood, sort of following once again in line, started to emerge after, after both the Mexican Mafia and the Black Gorilla family. Um, there are debates about exactly when they you know, came together. Some um, resources will say it was 1964 at San Quentin. Some place it as late as 1967. But rather than us work, figuring out the exact day on which the Aryan Brotherhood came about, we'll just say it was the mid-60s. And the key thing for them was a lot of it was a reactive gang. And I would argue that the Aryan Brotherhood, at least in their original um, sort of coming together, was a reactive response. They started to realize that white inmates, although still large in numbers in the prison system, were very diverse and very spread apart. There was no sort of cohesion amongst these groups of white inmates. And at the same time, during the late 50s and early 60s, we started to see co cohesion and solidarity starting to form between Mexican-American inmates and other Hispanic inmates, as well as amongst African-American inmates, right? Those groups started to create solidarity and became strong through the Mexican mafia, um, and the Black Gorilla family. The white inmates didn't really have that sort of solidarity. And so sure enough, as almost in response to the growing power from Black and Hispanic gangs, the Aryan Brotherhood came about to provide protection for white inmates. And we see in a lot of their imagery, we see things going back to Nordic and Celtic cultures, um, Germanic cultures. So we see things of the clover, we see the swastika, we still see even see things like the 666 um, showing up in their tattoos and, and, and artwork. Uh, the focus, since they were sort of a, a reactionary gang, in, in many ways, was that they weren't necessarily motivated, at least in, to start with, about 
power in, you know, from a, a financial point of view through drug trafficking. Nope. They weren't necessarily motivated by political goals like the Black Gorilla family. Rather, because of this sort of reaction to other groups sort of creating solidarity based upon race and ethnicity, their focus started to become very centralized around race. And, and that's why we often think of the Aryan Brotherhood as having a, a direct connection with white supremacy. Um, and as part of that, as sort of like a outcome of that, we see a heavy focus on crime and racial hatred within the Aryan Brotherhood. And perhaps surprising or not surprising, a lot of the criminal behavior engaged in by the Aryan Brotherhood is often at other white inmates who they feel, or other white groups who they feel are deviating from sort of this white supremacist approach um, and are mingling or, you know, cohabitating or working together with other racial ethnic groups. And that creates sort of infighting at, within sort of the Aryan Brotherhood. And it leads to fighting amongst them and other white groups. The Aryan Brotherhood has grown approximately 15,000 members in and out of prison. And according to the FBI, although the gang makes up less than 1% of the prison population, it is responsible for up to 18% of murders in the federal prison system. Now, one of the things, and if we have a chance this semester, we may get to it in a later lecture that we have to think about, is the Aryan Brotherhood is one particular white gang. Um, and sometimes individuals will assume that if somebody is a white inmate and they are part of a quote unquote prison gang that is focused on white supremacy, that they must be a member of the Aryan Brotherhood. And that is not the case. Um, and in fact, the Aryan Brotherhood, especially over the last couple decades, has, has really focused on recruiting who they think are only the best individuals. Now, these may be the smartest individuals, the most violent individuals, but individuals who they feel will, will suit their needs. And rarely will they sort of approach and sort of um, indoctrinate an individual who is, is very young. Um, they will slowly sort of bring somebody in from the fringe, um, and then it oftentimes it's not until they're at, you know, around age 30 that they'll start considering them to be a full-fledged a, a member of the Aryan Brotherhood. Two of the most notorious members of the Aryan Brotherhood are Barry Mills and Tyler Bingham. And I raise them, bring them up for, for two examples. We have pictures of them down there on the side. Um, I think Barry Mills, who's many people would argue is one of the, you know, historically one of the, the strongest individuals within the Aryan Brotherhood, um, shows me and it, I think illustrates one of those sort of lifestyles and coping approaches that we saw in a previous um, slide. This is an individual who from a young age, prison was all he knew or incarceration was all he knew. Um, he had gotten in trouble and spent some time as a youth in some facilities. And then as a young adult, he was incarcerated in the late 1960s and has spent or did spend pretty much the rest of his life incarcerated and bouncing around from prisons to facility to facility um, from the 1960s up until I believe it was around 2018 when he passed away. And so while he was there, not only did he become institutionalized and sort of start to see that the prison was his home, but he also knew how to understand the prison. And therefore, that gave him a lot of power. He knew how the prison system worked. And he knew how to use that to his advantage to gain power within the Aryan Brotherhood and thus allow the Aryan Brotherhood to grow in power. And then he had Tyler Bingham, who was one of his... Um, closest confederates in the Aryan Brotherhood. In 2002, they, as well as several other members of the Aryan Brotherhood, were charged under several RICO statutes. And it was in 2006, they were finally convicted and sentenced for murder, conspiracy, drug trafficking, and racketeering. And one of the things that surprised a lot of individuals, especially for Mills, was this is an individual who was convicted and sentenced for murder, conspiracy, drug trafficking, and racketeering. All of these things took place while he was incarcerated. Because remember, he was incarcerated from the late 1960s almost continually until the end of his life. Um, and so even though by having this federal um, statute with, with the RICO approach, and RICO is down here at the bottom if you're not familiar with it, 
Um, this allowed federal prosecutors the opportunity to target individuals like Bingham and Mills who may not necessarily have been the person who actually engaged in the murder or who necessarily sold or moved the drugs, but they were the shot callers. They were the people who organized it, the people who um, laid out the plans and designed it and made sure these things came to fruition. Um, and so what we see here is within this, I think this provides a good illustration of the longer individuals are in prison, it gives them sometimes a certain type of power and education that can be rather dangerous if not kept in check. The final prison gang we're going to talk about today is the Texas Syndicate. And the Texas Syndicate gained a foothold in California prisons in the late 1970s at Folsom Prison. And as the name suggests, this prison gang came from prison gangs out of Texas um, and found their way to California and, and, as I said, really started to grow and thrive in the late 1970s. And what made them sort of unique was their specific sort of connection with Mexican immigrants and rural Mexican Americans from Texas. So we saw within the Mexican Mafia, the initial divide led to a break between La M.A., the Mexican Mafia, and La Nuestra Familia, and that occurred in California, and it was a north-south divide or a rural-urban divide, however you choose to sort of typologize it. A similar thing happened for Mexican-American and Mexican immigrants who found their way coming from Texas and found their way into California prisons. These individuals were outsiders at a whole different level, right? They Not only were they potentially coming from more rural areas, areas that were coming straight from Mexico, but they didn't even have sort of any assimilation into California. So they were seen as outsiders by both La M.A. and Nuestra Familia, and they needed to have protection for these individuals who found their way to California and then ended up being incarcerated in California's prisons. Now, you may ask the question, well, how are Texas inmates finding their way out to California? Um, and probably the simplest way to kind of give an overview of it is to think about the drug trafficking. And we talked before about the power and control that the Mexican mafia in particular had with drug trafficking that originated from Central America and Mexico and then found its way into America. And if you think about just follow the path of the substances that come from either Central America or Mexico, they find their way into America, into the United States, by crossing the border in Arizona, New Mexico, California, or especially in that big state with a lot of border borderland in Texas. So individuals who may have been running drugs or engaged in other criminal enterprises who, who were in Texas or in Mexico found their way into Texas and then started coming west as part of you know, running drugs and other um, criminal-based enterprises. They find themselves in California. They get busted for the criminal enterprises they're engaged in. They find themselves incarcerated in California prisons, and now they are the outsider, right? They don't fit in with either La M.A. or Nuestra Familia, and therefore they are, you know, prone to abuse, and therefore they need protection. And that's where we see the Texas, in, the Texas syndicate really starting to grow and gain a foothold in California as sort of the, the expansion of criminal enterprises, drug trafficking, etc., spread throughout the United States. Okay, I'm going to leave it there for today, and we will continue our investigation of the prisons in our next lecture, but we'll stop there for now and have a good day.